Web Marketing Networks podcast, episode number 106, with today's guest, Frank Breer, the author of the book, Scale. Welcome to the Web Marketing Networks podcast. Come behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. My name's Adam Franklin, and you are listening to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. This is the show for people like you, like me, who love marketing on the web. You'll be taken behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments, where we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We confess what's failed and reveal the truth about what really works. This podcast is brought to you by our book, which is also called Web Marketing That Works, and there's a special gift for you, our listener, and that is the 33 free marketing templates from our book. You can get your hands on those at bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. Today's guest is a gentleman by the name of Frank Breer. He's the author of the book Scale, How to Grow Your Business by Working Less. And he helps business owners break through the revenue barrier and also get their life back. He specializes in helping companies grow from six figures to seven figures. And a big part of that comes down to how you can scale and how you can build a platform on the web. So in today's show, we're going to dive deep into the four key aspects of being able to scale a business and be able to step out of that feast or famine business model that so many business owners fall into the trap of. And I know from first-hand experience that Toby and I were in that feast or famine business model for many years. And following some of the principles that Frank talks about, we've been able to extract ourselves from that. So I won't steal Frank's thunder. What I'm going to do is hand over to the interview and we can hear it straight from Frank. I'm Adam Franklin, and on the line, I have Frank Breer. How are you, Frank? Doing great, Adam. How are you doing? Really well, thanks. Really well. So you're the author of the book, Scale, How to Grow Your Business by Working Less. What sort of stuff do you take readers through in the book? Yeah, the book focuses on unlocking the four keys to scale. So when somebody is uh, dealing with a business where they are maxed out and they're looking to grow beyond a revenue barrier, they usually bump up against it. It, you know, either looks like, you know, I can't quite get the revenue to get above a certain point, or you're, you're dealing with this feast and famine where it's like a lot, you know, do really good months and then not so good months. That's when it's time for you to scale. So the four keys that I talk about are number one concept. You have to have a scalable concept. Sometimes what we need to do is actually change the business structure slightly in order to allow us to scale. And that change can oftentimes just be a slight change in the business model, a slight change in the audience that we're serving, or even a focus on an audience that is going to be able to, so we we can monetize a little bit better. Uh, The second thing we focus on, the second key is the business model itself. Now here, I talk to business owners about creating a stable, diverse, and set of revenue that is going to be recurring, right? So stable, diverse, and recurring. And what that means is instead of this feast or famine where, you know, you do project work and it comes in and then, you know, you don't have anything coming in for a while, we want to create uh, things that where the revenue is constant over a longer period of time. And if you're in a business model where there's a lot of seasonal peaks, seasonal highs and lows, you want to look at finding elements that allow you to make up that revenue in those seasonal low points. So it may be deploying your business assets in a slightly different business area that is hot during those months, right? Or it's maybe providing additional related services that are interesting in those off months to kind of help fill in the gaps. And then the third key we move on to is market. And that is understanding how to automate your marketing, have a scalable market. So you aren't chasing down every single sales lead every single time. You have a constant flow of new prospects that are coming in that you have an automated way that you're building a relationship, building credibility over time, and they have a way to engage with you that will lead to sales. 
And then the final key we talk about are processes. You have scalable processes. And this is where business owners dissect the way that you prepare to deliver your product or service, actually deliver your product or service and service your customers after you deliver. We look at each of those processes and understand what it takes to actually have that done. I walk business owners through a mapping exercise. It's a red, yellow, green, where red is something that I have to do personally as the business owner. Green is something someone else is doing. Yellow, something that I'm doing today, but probably someone else should be doing it. And we look to re-engineer those processes with the end goal of turning all the boxes green, essentially to fire yourself from the business. I can totally relate with the feast and famine concept because for many years we ran an agency and we learned a lot doing that. But one of the challenges was that you'd either have a huge project on and you needed more staff and you needed more bods to actually execute the project. But then, of course, once the project was over, all yeah. of a sudden you had all these mouths to feed and you were there exactly. you know, hunting for the next project. And it was a real roller coaster ride. But you know, thankfully, some of the things we were able to implement enabled us to smooth that out quite a bit, including yeah. having some full-time staff and then but half contractors so you could turn them on and turn them off depending on the work that was on. But it's still very difficult. And certainly one of the things, you know, the whole idea of having leads coming into the company and having an automated way of, I guess, educating them and nurturing them to hopefully become clients. That was something that was really valuable. But you talked about you having this automated way of attracting leads and, and educating them and whatnot. I'm presuming that's very much through online systems and processes. Well, it can be through online systems and processes, but generally speaking, I, I mean, there, oftentimes most businesses have some way of communicating via email, right? So that could be as electronic as it gets. I mean, there are a number of businesses that scale up quite nicely where the marketing may be live, it may be events, et cetera, but still there's an email marketing component to what's going on, right? The thing that most people struggle with, it's it's usually not the automating of the lead generation, right? Because there are a lot of people who know how to you know run ads and get on ad networks and things like that. But if you're selling, and especially as you're, the programs or the products that you offer become higher and higher ticket, you need to have some way of building a relationship and credibility during that time. So the thing that most business owners are missing is a framework that where they can think about what it means to build a relationship. And so I like to use a framework that everyone is sort of familiar with, like going shopping. <laughs> and if you think about what you have to do in your head... When you decide to go into a store and buy something, it's actually very similar to the same sales mindset that every prospect needs to go through before they decide to buy something from you. So, you know, if you imagine if you go into a mall or, a, or near some stores and, and you're just kind of hanging outside of a store you've never seen before, you might take a look at the sign. What's the windows? You know, I've never I don't know what the story is. Maybe it's for me. Maybe it's not. You're kind of just hanging out like loitering outside the store. And it's the store's job to quickly articulate what its value proposition is to encourage you to step in, right? So if I make this the decision to step inside the store and I start looking around, I might see some uh, things that are laid out for me. But what ends up happening oftentimes is a salesperson comes running up to you and says, can I help you? And what most of us say is, no, thanks. I'm just looking. <laughs> so I like to call these folks lookers. <laughs> these are folks who want to experience what it is that you have to provide and want to understand what that end result looks like for them. So when you think about a furniture store, right? They, they don't stack the beds up against a wall. They lay them out on the floor. They put the bedspreads on. They put the pillows and they put the nightstands and they make it all look like your bedroom so that you can actually visualize what this is going to look like in your life. Well, we need to do the same thing for these lookers. We need to start painting pictures of what your life is like at the end. And that's an important relationship builder because it is only after the person realizes that you can change their life for the better, better that you have earned the right to now have a sales conversation with them. That's the next step. You know, when you're in a store, people can see this. People who are just browsing, they kind of just wander aimlessly back and forth in the aisles. But when something catches someone's attention, their behavior changes, right? They actually double back. They go look at the tags. They read the labels. They take things off the rack. They start to compare them. You're interested in the facts and figures. These are the shoppers. I call these people shoppers. And really good salespeople know how to engage a shopper when they've become a shopper. 
by actually engaging in the middle of the conversation, right? They come up and they say, ooh, that would look really good on you, or that was a really popular model, or, you know, this has got great battery life. Whatever it is, they engage you in the middle of the conversation. They don't start over with, can I help you? And we need to do the same thing too in our marketing. We need to engage in the middle of the conversation by tracking the kinds of things that were interesting to our lookers when they were hearing about case studies, hearing about testimonials, um, watching video tutorials, learning. So now we can engage in that conversation. And then finally, when that sales conversation goes well and we've outlined the benefits to the customer, then they need, you know, they want to buy. So they want to go find the cash register. And I don't know if this is true in Australia like it is in the United States, but we have some stores where it is impossible to find the cash register. (laughs) You're like wandering around the store. They've tried to create this really clever layout, but there's nobody at a cash register. And so you've got stuff in your hand and you're trying to buy. I call that hiding the cash register. Sometimes stores do that. Well, sometimes we do that as business owners too. We hide the cash register by not making it clear how to engage, especially when, you know, if we're doing a lot of uh, B2B kind of transactions, It may be difficult. There may be contracts, there may be meetings, there may be, you know, the things, forms that need to be filled out. We need to be very clear about what it takes to actually transact that business and uh, take that buyer and kind of shepherd them through the process so that they can actually become a customer. And then you've also got some of the stores where, like, like Apple, they seem to deliberately hide the cash register, but it's not hidden, it's really everywhere. I was, you know, just buying, I think, a replacement cable to charge my phone. And you could actually just scan it on your phone and pay literally there without yeah. even chatting to one of the sales assistants. They make it incredibly mm-hmm. easy. But, but of course, everybody knows you can go into Apple and you can walk out you know, several thousand dollars lighter without you know, too much effort. <laughs> um, they, they've really mastered it. But it's just, it's, I mean, in that situation, it, it's super easy because there's no friction. You know, if you actually queue up at a cash register at Apple, you might be there for half an hour. But the fact right. you can actually just scan it and buy and be emailed your receipt is phenomenal. Well, and that's because Apple has a really good sense of exactly what kind of experience they're trying to craft, right? They know exactly what their customers expect and they know where the value proposition is. The value proposition is when I take out my credit card and I buy something, you know? So to make that as easy as possible, that's a really good analogy of the kind of process work we need to do in our own companies to figure out where the bottlenecks are, you know, where are we queuing up? Where should we not be queuing up? You know, a really great example, uh, the D- Disney. If you go to Disney World, the shortest line in the entire experience is the one to buy your ticket. You will <laughs> wait almost no time to buy a ticket. Now, once you've purchased a ticket at Disney World, they've broken even on you. That The cost of admission, it pays for your cost to be there that day. Now, everything else you do, the, you know, the knickknacks and the food and the restaurants and all the other stuff that you might do, the churros, <laughs> whatever, that's all bonus. That's all profit. And so they kind of don't care as much about that. I mean, they do. But that line to buy that initial ticket to get into the park is the shortest one because they know that's the one that's the bottleneck. That's going to keep you from going into the park the very first time. Interesting. Interesting. That makes a whole lot of sense. So you've also got a, a golfing acronym, the PGA. Can you talk us yes. through, uh, <laughs> that was a really good hook because I remember it from watching um, you know, yeah. the training material, but uh, I guess the, the, the first P, if I'm correct, is platform. That's and right. And obviously it's important to, to build that platform, but can you talk to me about what a platform is and how we might build one? Yes. So the, the acronym you're describing, the PG acronym, describes the process by which a service-based business scales up. And there is a formula essentially for this, and it's following these three big milestones. And then for a platform, the very first thing that a service-based business needs to do is to find their voice and then get on a soapbox big enough to project that voice out as far as they can. And a platform literally is something you stand on, right, in order to project your voice out. So there are a lot of different kinds of platforms that a service-based business owner might take. They may write a book. They may have a podcast like yours. They may have a speaking circuit that they participate in. They may have a broadcast uh, media, like they may use YouTube or they may host their own sort of video broadcast. 
Nowadays, they may be on Blab or Periscope or something. But the platform is really a place for you to plant yourself and, and establish your voice, your message, your authority. And it's important to start with that because audience building is the number one skill that business owners need to have to master in order to scale up their businesses. The feast or famine problem that you talked about that I've faced in my own business at times is all about not having a big enough audience that is you know, being handled on a regular basis, that's being carried through a marketing process. And so by having a larger platform, we get our voice out there. So some business owners may choose two or three different platforms that work well from them. You know, some people may decide that speaking's not for them, or some people may decide they're not happy with video and they, they just do audio. And it kind of doesn't matter. It's just really about having that in place. Okay. So in terms of like web marketing activities that people can be doing in terms of actually growing the number of people in their audience, what are some tactical things that listeners can start doing to increase that audience size? Yeah. So, you know, in some sense, the the tactical pieces of web marketing that allow you to grow an audience are the kinds of things that, you know, you've talked about in your book that people talk about a lot about um, making sure that you have these stages, these steps in place to do marketing. But when they don't work, typically it's because the messaging is off, right? The messaging's muddy. It's not quite clear. And so interestingly enough, as people start to build audiences, one of the very first things that they need to do is to create a niche and to really focus their efforts on something that is meaningful to a particular audience. Now, this is a little counterintuitive to people because they think, well, I'm trying to grow. So why would I shrink my focus if I'm trying to grow my company? But in fact, it's a little bit of like there's two variables to play with, right? One is how many people in your addressable market and how many of them can you turn into fans, right? And I can increase my addressable market by going wider and wider and wider and wider. But what ends up happening is, is that I become so boring and same and mushy that the conversion rate actually goes down. But by reducing your focus down to a niche, you can do some amazing things. First of all, you can show up exactly where these people hang out. Second of all, you can talk about pain points and benefits that are uniquely focused on them. And when you and you become sort of a the expert in that niche and the combination of those three things actually up your conversion rate uh, potential for that audience. What happens is, is that the more you niche down, you actually gain more traction than you lose in audience size. And so even though you think, well, there's less people I'm talking to, your effectiveness with that audience is increased to a place where it actually turns out better for you. That's interesting because as you know, we were speaking before the show about my experience with that and historically we've been targeting people that wear a marketing hat, which is really quite broad. You could be a business owner that happens to yep. do marketing as well. You could yeah. be a marketing manager within a corporation or you could be a marketing consultant. And what we've discovered in the last six months is that the people that actually buy from us and, and pay to join our online courses are predominantly marketing consultants. So that revelation for Toby and myself has been really powerful because now we know that the tools that we release and the future products that we can create, if we tailor it towards marketing consultants, then we're likely to get a whole lot more traction. So we'll be running a whole bunch of tests to, to validate that. But certainly from our welcome calls, from our surveys, and from the people that we notice on Twitter and on our email list that sort of reply and interact with us. There's so many marketing consultants on there mm -hmm. that I really feel that could be a little a little breakthrough for us to have made that discovery and, and niche, yeah. niche down, as we say in Australia, or niche down, as, as you say, stateside. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds it sounds a lot cooler when you say it. I think I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I guess if I go to America, nobody knows what you mean if you say niche down. And in Australia, niche. people go niche. Those bloody Americans. I wish I'd say it properly. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got, we've got listeners in both, so I'll, I'll just say both of them there. No, that's really powerful. And then how about the G and the A of, of the PGA? Yeah, formula? so so once you've established a platform, then we move into into focusing on groups. So this movement from one to one to one to many is an important transition 
that you have to make when you're scaling up your business. And a lot of people, I think, know this intuitively. But when you start to talk to groups and you start to develop group programs, I like to talk about them in terms of what I call a program ascension cycle. So that means that we're going to create programs that address the group in a way that allow me to add additional value, higher and higher value, therefore higher and higher prices, right? Because there's going to be a correlation between them. And if I do it correctly, I'm going to move maybe from, I start off by teaching something. So I have a course, right? And then maybe at a higher level is I'm going to create some level of accountability or mentorship in that program. Okay. So that's kind of a a slightly better version of a program. And then maybe uh, there's an opportunity to, to do some done for you kind of services, right? And that's a higher level. And then at the very highest level, the thing that people pay the most amount of money for are experiences. And so this gives us an opportunity to create different kinds of group offerings, group programs that take a large audience. We get to pull out from that large audience an ideal set of clients to move up to the next level. We continue to grow that group. We get to pull up again, another ideal set into the next group. And what's gone on here is that we are able to run a cycle. And when you're transitioning from a one-on-one business to a group-oriented business, one of the difficult things is you can't just like fire all your one-on-one clients <laughs> and start over again. So by doing this ascension cycle, what it allows you to do is you slowly take the very best ideal clients and you charge them more. And as you are charging more, you can then dump out the ones that aren't working with you, you know, aren't working for you. They're a non-ideal clients that it's kind of a pain or a hassle or that bottom 20% or whatever you want to call it. And as you continue to do that cycle, what you end up with is more and more of these group ideal clients, less and less of the one-on-one stuff you don't want to do. And it slowly transforms your business. Generally speaking, when people execute that formula, that's kind of when they have that program ascension cycle in place is generally when they pass the seven figure mark. Now, the A stands for assets, because that's what we all want to create in a business or assets. And so these business assets tend to look like products. For example, intellectual property or technology or software, something that changes from that one to many to the zero to many. That's really our end goal. And the big mistake that a lot of companies make is they jump there too quickly. A lot of people wake up in the morning and think, I've got a great idea for a product. Let's build a company that builds a product. Perfectly legitimate business model, but a very different set of steps. And I've spent a lot of time in that space. But basically what you end up looking like is you end up looking like a tech startup, right? So you you have a product you're trying to build. You have no customers. You have no audience. You have no credibility. It takes a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of living out of your car (laughs) to make that work. But if if you put this at the end... You've built an audience, you've built credibility, you've built the cash flow, and you come out with a product that you actually have a natural audience and fans that want, and you've been able to talk to them. You know, you've been able to, a la Ryan Levesque, go ask them what they want, right? Survey them, figure out what their needs are, and then deliver to that. And now you move into a product life cycle. You are an enterprise that's delivering a product. You have business assets which are beyond you. And you've scaled from one to one to one to many to zero to many. So those three big milestones are the ones that successful entrepreneurs that are trying to make that leap into the next stratosphere of their revenue have to go through. Okay. So you've spoken about a few things that that people do wrong, including not niching down or niching down. And also just then you mentioned building the product first without an audience and without uh, customers or anything else. What are some other... I guess, rookie mistakes that you see business owners or people making that if they did things differently, they'd probably have much better results. Yeah, I I think one of the big ones is not focusing on audience building. And I think, you know, in the internet marketing community, we talk about list building. Uh, Clearly, you want a list. But I like to use the word audience because um, an audience list is listening to you. <laughs> a list may not be, right? Um, you may be ma- emailing a list and you're, you're looking at oh, low open rates or whatever, but an audience is someone who's chosen to be there and is sitting there listening to what you have to say. Then that audience, a portion of that audience are going to turn into fans. And I define a fan 
as somebody who is now actively participating in your revenue generation. In other words, they're sharing your stuff. They're sharing you on social media. They're a referral partner. They are, you know, getting a bonus if they sign up their friends, you know, whatever viral kind of uh, infrastructure you have in place for sharing and referring. But so many people, when they start a service-based business, grow a successful business based on referrals and networking and things like that. And so they believe that they can just continue to do that. And so they know they need to build an audience to build an email list, but they kind of don't think it's that big of a deal because, you know, hey, I'm making a pretty good living on this six-figure business with just referrals and word of mouth. You know, I've got a, a client that I worked with when he started with me. He's a family therapist and he's booked out three months. I mean, you can't get an appointment with him for three months, no matter what you wanted to do. And so that does get you a little bit sort of fat and lazy, you know what I mean, <laughs> when, when you've got that kind of process in place. But um, the reason he came to me is because he said, listen, if my butt's not on the couch, I'm not making any money, right? So that's the challenge. And when people sort of forget that they need to be doing this audience building, they can prematurely launch into some of these things. Like a lot of people will launch a course before they have an audience and, you know, spend a lot of time building something without really knowing if anyone wants it. You know, the first time you, you launch a course with a, you, you don't have to have a huge audience to launch a course, but you do have to listen carefully to what they want to say. And so, you know, a lot of people talk about course building. Uh, Danny Innie talks about this. Jeff Walker talks about this, about building courses on the fly, right? As your audience becomes aware of the problems that you're solving, they've got questions to ask you, you can continue on. So I would say one of the big rookie mistakes that I see people making is building stuff too soon. It doesn't have to be a product. It could even be a course. It could even be a group program. It could be a podcast. It could be anything without really listening carefully to the people that, you're, that are in your audience and adapting as quickly as you can. It's really interesting that you talk about that because one of the, I guess, in, in my personal journey um, in business, we were an agency and we had that feast or famine that, that you spoke about. But about seven, probably six or seven years ago, we started releasing marketing templates for free online. You know, people could just download them. And what happened then is that there was, it started getting traction and people from all over the world were downloading them and, and joining our Blue Y News email list. And, you know, all of a sudden it sort of grew and grew and grew. And before we knew it, there was, you know, thousands and thousands of people now, you know, tens of thousands of people on that. But what it allowed us to, well, firstly, we realized that, you know, we can't service people as an agency as or consultants. We couldn't service people outside of basically Brisbane or Sydney, mm -hmm. certainly not very easily at people outside of Australia. And then we thought, well, there's all these people in our, in our audience who know us and hopefully are beginning to like us and hopefully trust us. But what can we do to help service them? And it kind of forced us to think, all right, well, how do we take what we're doing and package it up in an online format so that they can access it and, and benefit from it and we can also earn the revenue from it too. So that actual process of building the audience opened up that avenue for us. And right. you know, since then, as the international audience has grown significantly, we've now you know, got the luxury of not being totally dependent on that feast or famine type of work. And in recent years, we've, we've discontinued the agency work. We can choose to do consulting when we want to, but I really enjoy it now because our primary focus is on, is on the online courses and listening to what our audience needs and wants and then, and then tailoring programs that suit them. So, you know, a great point, like even if you are a booked out consultant for, for three months in advance, even if you're busy, like starting that audience can just open up different opportunities for you, for further down the track, and at least you've then got the option. You know, you can stay booked out if you want, but you can also, you know, explore other options for, you know, bringing revenue in and helping people in different areas. So, now that's exactly that's just my personal experience on your point there, Frank. Yeah. You just told the story of all four keys of scale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Now, Frank. That's been an awesome interview. Have you got any closing thoughts or final pieces of advice or anything you just want to get off your chest before we call it a day? Sure. I, I, uh, a lot of people you know, ask me kind of why scale? Why is that your thing? And I'll tell you, I feel very passionate that building a scalable business allows you to 
achieve the kind of freedom that you really wanted to when you became an entrepreneur? I mean, there's the old joke that says um, an entrepreneur is someone who works 70 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week, right? Um, <laughs> and But I think nobody really goes into becoming an entrepreneur in order to get burned out. Um, we all did it with the idea of creating freedom for ourselves. And one of the most frustrating things I hear, even from very successful entrepreneurs, is that they're just not getting the kind of personal freedom that they expected they would get when they started their business. And I will tell you that scale, scaling your business is the key to that. So if you are in a business right now where you feel burned out, where you feel that it's not passionate, where you feel like you're giving up parts of your life that have had to be sacrificed on the altar of your entrepreneurship, this is the ticket out. It is about scaling your business. That is the way to continue a successful enterprise and basically create back for yourself the freedom to pursue your passion, your hobby, your friends, your family, whatever is important to you, whatever those key priorities are in your life. And I feel really passionate about that. That's why I do what I do. And I would just say for anyone who's listening, if you feel like that story speaks to you, that's the ticket out. That's where you need to go. Awesome. And Frank, where can people go to find out more about you and to get your book as well? Sure. So you can find out more information about me at frankbria.com. That's uh, frankbria.com. And the book Scale is at scalebookoffer.com. You can go there. You can find it on Amazon uh, as well. But if you go to scalebookoffer.com, you know, there's an opportunity for you to register the book and uh, get some bonus video training and things like that, that you wouldn't get if you just bought it from Amazon, you know, it links through there. But, uh, you know, we just send your receipt in and, and we'll uh, make sure you get hooked up with all that free bonus material. Awesome, Frank. Thank you so much for coming on the show and have yourself a great afternoon. Thanks so much. I, my pleasure, Adam. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. And that's a wrap for my chat with Frank Bria. Awesome stuff there, I felt. There was so much to apply and to think about. And I actually had a quick chat with Frank after I had hit um, stop recording. And I asked him, what are some of the challenges that marketing consultants face? And there were two common traps that marketing consultants found themselves in. The first is that they can't make enough money and they're not getting enough leads. So basically, the famine stage of feast or famine. And of course, the other one is that they were maxed out, they couldn't take a break, vacation, and they were just go, go, go. So of course, that's the feast part of feast or famine. So Frank shared some really awesome tips. And he said, if you are in the famine stage, you can't make enough money and you're not getting enough leads, really try and work out what your niche or your niche is. Work out, it might seem too beginner and too basic for a marketing consultant to think about their buyer personas, but it's so important because if you can work out the actual people that you deliver the most value to, not necessarily everybody but you serve, but the people you deliver the most value to. And that rung true for me because, as you know, like even in the show, I said that we're finally niching down now on marketing consultants. And previously, we've serviced everybody who wears a marketing hat, which could be consultants or marketing managers or CEOs or, or business owners, you know, depending on the size of the business. But now that we've niched down on that, it's a lot more clear that we need to create more and more content and material and value for marketing consultants. So anyway, if you can't get enough money and you're not getting enough leads, really try and work out your exact niche because otherwise you might just be too bland or too similar to differentiate yourself in the market. Okay, and you also had some great advice if you're in the feast stage and you're maxed out, you haven't taken a vacation, you're burning out, maybe you're not even enjoying it anymore, or you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Now, he said, here, really try and productize what you do. So, for example, take your methodology or take what you're teaching your clients and turn that into some sort of program or course or product so that they can access it, they can pay for it, but you don't need to be actually doing every single bit of it yourself. The other component that Frank suggested was turning to group services. So instead of doing one-on-one -on -one consulting, maybe you could free up your time a little bit and also still deliver the same amount of value by doing, say, group coaching calls. I mean, half the time as a consultant, you're often telling people all the same stuff anyway. It's just as valuable if you're telling it directly to one person as if you're telling it to 
10 people at a time in person or via a webinar. So consider doing group sessions too if you're maxed out and you're in the, uh, in the feast uh, phase of it all. So anyway, two extra bits that I learned from Frank just after we hit stop on the record. But a great interview. I'm actually, I've just actually downloaded his book on Kindle. It's called Scale, How to Grow Your Business by Working Less. I'm going to sink my teeth into that because it has been, the business has been a lot more enjoyable, rewarding, liberating in the last three or so years since Toby and I have stopped doing a lot of the services work and we've moved more to some consulting, some products, some group sessions like public speaking or group workshops. I know there's a lot more to learn from Frank and I am going to check out his book and I encourage you to have a read of it too, especially if you're looking to go from a six-figure business to a seven-figure business and break through the revenue barrier and also get your life back. Okay, so just to wrap up, that show was brought to you by our book, Web Marketing That Works. And of course, the 33 free marketing templates are all yours at bluewiremedia.com.au. If you want to get a hold of me, that's easy. I'm adam.franklin at bluewiremedia.com.au or shoot me a tweet, franklin underscore adam. And if you enjoyed the show, and I really hope you did because I certainly got a lot from it from Frank, I would love it if you could take 60 seconds now and leave me a honest review on iTunes because the ratings and the reviews make a huge difference to our visibility. And if we're consistently in the what's hot, which thanks to you we have been, then we can continue getting good quality guests on the show and sharing their message with more and more people. So thank you for listening right to the end and I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.